say though that after trying to or doing my best as I can with uh, this scripture, I have a lot more respect for what pastor does every Sunday in terms of preparing to teach and because I started I'm thinking why did I sign up for this? <laughs> but I as um, Sister Debbie would say we weren't volunteers we were voluntold and pretty much I had no choice in the matter. Um, from yesterday to today there's someone who's been contacting me from Guyana and um, she's been pretty much asking for prayer because she's not a Christian and she says she has difficulty in lining up, so to speak. So if you don't mind, she just texts me again and says, please remember me in prayer. So I don't, I, there's an urgency as far as I'm concerned. If you can join me as we, her name is Barbara. Heavenly Father, you know Barbara as she is in Guyana somewhere, I don't know exactly the location. And her desire is to know you in a personal way. And she's having difficulty in either believing or finding the right church or whatever it is that is, is holding her back. And I pray, Father, that you, your Holy Spirit would release her now that she will freely surrender her life to you. That she'll find a place in the church that she needs to go to that will teach her your ways. And as she surrender her life to you to, and the Holy Spirit begin to dwell within her, that she'll understand who you really are. Thank you, Father, for allowing this moment and this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just to follow um, <clears throat> Sister Sheila, the compassion, be compassionate one to another. My um, line is stimulate love in one another. Now, let me see if I can find it. Oh, I just missed it. Why did I do that? Oh, here we go. Um, we all know John 13, 34, it says, A new commandment I give, give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. This is a new translation. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. We all know that scripture, right? Talk to me, it helps, it helps so much. <laughs> um, we all know that scripture, correct? And we all understand the fact that we've been commanded to love. But what I never really did stop to think about is that we're also being taught how to stimulate love in each other. And sometimes if you look around at people and how can you really stimulate love in somebody who is like a pain to you? Or, um, or is annoying or someone that stole from you, someone that has hurt you, but you gotta stimulate love in them. So I was trying to find out more and more uh, as I looked into this scripture, how do we stimulate love in, in a person? And I realized that pretty much it's an everyday thing that we need to do. Because Hebrews 10.24 says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So as I thought about it, I'm like, hmm. My first thought when I get up in the morning is what do I have to do for the rest of the day? And how my day is gonna end? How much money I have in my pocket? Can I pay all my bills? Do I have enough to eat? How am I feeling today? But pretty much what should be on our mind most of all when we get up first thing in the morning is whomever we come in contact to, come contact with, how can we stimulate them unto love and to good deeds? I don't know what your morning is like when you get up in the morning, if that's what you think about, or in some cases as you get a little old and you get up and you stand up and let no pain today, we good, right? <clears throat> or you're able to get off the bed and you realize that you can actually move, we're good. So I, I, I looked into it more and more and I realized this is supposed to be part of our daily worship to God. As we get about a bed, our thought should be, how can I stimulate someone to love? And what does it really mean to stimulate someone to love? Especially you go to work and you may have that one person, that one person, no matter where you turn, they're always there in your face and you just wish that they could just disappear or you could do something to make them disappear and you wouldn't have to pay the price for. But yet, 
you have to stimulate them unto love. So, in reading that particular scripture, um, Hebrew 10, 24, I recognize that it starts with the word and, and and pretty much as we know in the English language, I failed English by the way, um, and is a conjunction. And the conjunction is joining two sentences together so you can get the full sentence. So I decided to go back from where the verse, the, the, the sentence actually started, which starts in the 23rd verse and ends at the 25th verse, actually. And it pretty much goes like this in the King James versions. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Trust, which faith means pretty much you're trusting. Faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And King James has a way of using the old English, so I decided to go to the English Standard Version and I read it in that version and it said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Now the word faith changed to hope here without wavering for he who promise is faithful, which is God, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I notice there's a difference between the King James and the uh, English Standard Version. In the New Standard Version, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises is faithful and there's a period after that. In the King James Version, there's a colon. And a colon just means there's a continuation, same sentence, same, you know, you know I'm not teaching English today because I can't. Um, but it begins with N. So sometimes these translations kind of make a little, their own little thing to it. But verses 24, and it says, uh, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. There's a comma that follows that. In the King James Version, it's a colon again. So which means after a colon, there's a list of reasons why or how you should stir up one another. So I was looking through that and trying to figure it out and realize, oh, so there's some things that we have to do as believers. Now, I always try to find a reason. The kids, everybody has, you know, you, you meet those people from time to time and say, I don't have to go to church. I don't need to be in church. I don't have to give the pastor my money and this kind of stuff. So I, I always just say, well, it's true. You don't have to go to church, but the Bible says forsake not the assemblance of yourself together. And most of the times, I never really understood why we need to do that. I just said because the Bible said it. You might have done that too. I don't know. But what I've recognized is this. There's a reason why we meet. Um, as it says, not neglecting to meet together as is a habit of some, but encourage one another as all the more as you see the day is drawing. Um, I'm not a football fan, but how many of you have seen football and playing on, seen the football playing, right? You with me? Talk to me. It helps. It helps. It helps. <clears throat> okay. You ever notice that when that little time comes, they have that little huddle that goes on, then they come back and they play again? I remember a preacher told, saying this a long time ago. He says, that's what we're supposed to be like whenever we meet. We come into a huddle, get the strategy to play for the day or the week, whatever it is, and you go back out and you play. Pretty much that's what this uh, 25th verse is saying in Hebrews 10. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Verses 23 says, um, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a physical thing we're holding on to. It's more of a, a heart thing or a soul thing, so to speak, where it's in our spirits to hold on to the faith. And faith, the, this hope that pastor was teaching us about, is not like the hope of the, how the world puts it. As uh, the world normally puts it, as a comedy you, meaning wishful thinking or you probably, there may be, or that kind of stuff. 
But the hope in God is more of a confident thing. You know that what God says is going to happen. Uh, so holding on, believing that God will um, keep his promise. Now there's a series of promises that God has made for us. Um, I keep forgetting I need to use my glasses. It says, embrace your hope, hold fast to your hope, be hope-filled, or be a hope-filled person, uh, pretty much being a confident person, because hope in God, because God has made to us promises. For example, in Hebrews 10, 16, it says, this is the covenant that I will make with, with them after those, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. He has also promised to remember your sins no more, which is Hebrews 10, 17. And their sins and in iniquities will I remember no more. Again, he promised to work in you and us what is pleasing in his sight. Hebrews 13, 21 says, Make you per he, uh, he makes you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever amen he has promised that we will be perfect for all times by a single sacrifice which is Jesus Christ for Hebrews Hebrews 10 14 says for by one offering he had perfect for every forever them that that are sanctified he has promised never to leave us or forsake us Hebrews 13 Five says, let your conversations be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I remember even writing a song about that too. That the Lord will never ever leave you. He has promised to bring good from all our pain. Hebrews 12 10 says, for they verily for, for, they verily for a few days chasten us after he their own pleasure but he for our profit that was that we might be partakers of his holiness but guess what we know all of this kind of stuff um, but still when we get up in the mornings the first thought of provoking one another to love is never in our minds <clears throat> we can find ourselves sometimes in a situation because if we were let's say if we were to uh, get up in the morning and or don't get up in the morning just decide we're going to stay in bed all day and relax and um, because all these promises that God has made to us is going to happen pretty much it will never happen we have to be able to get up and manifest God's perfect will in our lives right so when you go down to 23 24 sorry now it begins to make sense let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. This really is supposed to be the focus of our lives. Every day you get up, you should be thinking, how can I provoke somebody else to love and to do good deeds? We, we complain about the many things that we see happening around the world. We, we complain about who's doing what and that kind of stuff. And I could tell you, it is a hard deal to be able to convince or, or stimulate somebody that is annoying you or stealing from you or hurting you unto love and good deeds. But there's a scripture said that, has, that speaks about let your light so shine before men that they may see God and glorify him in heaven. And that's pretty much what we need to be doing. That's, that's how we're supposed to be living our lives on a daily level uh, where they see God in us as opposed to seeing something else in us. And it's not as easy as we say it is. This is why um, when I, I have some friends or some, I had some co-workers actually I should say, that would say this Christian thing, is that so easy? Just say, Lord I surrender, that's it especially the, my, the Muslim comrades that I used to talk to. And I'm like uh, no, you still have to allow the Holy Spirit to guide and lead you throughout the day. I mean, you guys read the, these laws and you follow it, but we still allow the Holy Spirit to tell us what to do and what not to do. And there was an occasion that came up at work, um, when one of the patients had said something to me that was very derogatory, and I looked at him and I smiled and I said, it's okay, 
I know you're in pain right now, so anything will come out of your mouth. And he's saying to me, you take that? I said, you just have to let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. I said, that's what I'm talking about. Just let it go. Right? Um, later on, the, the, that particular patient actually came back to the office and says, listen, I just want to apologize to you for uh, what I'd said to you. It wasn't the right thing, and it shouldn't be directed to you anyways. But I just thought to myself, at that moment, had I reacted to what he had said to me, how, what would have been the outcome? What would have been the testimony? And I, and I remember that, and I thought, oh, I guess that's one of the ways you stimulate people onto love and good deeds. Um, so as believers, let us remember that our daily living, first thing you get up in the morning, you tell, ask yourself the question, how can I or ask God to help you to stimulate somebody to love and good deeds? And now I think, Sister Jeanette.